Okay, so we are continuing on in our series of following Jesus, and um, I'm going to be talking about resisting temptation. Everybody's thinking, I knew I should have slept in this morning. (laughs) Why did I come? No, you're going to love it. Resisting temptation. So obviously we're talking about following Jesus and becoming more like Jesus. That's the goal. That's the goal, to become more like Jesus as we go on in our Christian walk. And, and part of that is to learn and, and get better at resisting temptation. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So let's have a look at a scripture, Hebrews 4 and verses 15 and 16 in the NIV. And it says here, For we do not have a high priest, so that's Jesus, that's talking about Jesus, who is unable to empathise with our weaknesses. Amen. Thank God for that. We haven't got a God that just, you know, thinks do better. Do better. No, empathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Now, I, I, I think, you know, does that mean Jesus was tempted to sit on the lounge all day and eat chocolate like I am? No, <laughs> no, he wasn't. But in every kind of way, and we're going to talk about that, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So, so this is the Jesus we're following, who was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And then it goes on, it says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now that last verse could apply to any situation in life where you need grace and you need help and you need mercy. And I know we usually think about grace as unmerited favour, but it can also mean an empowerment When God graces us to do something, he empowers us. There's a supernatural anointing that enables us to do things we would not be able to do if we weren't born again. If we were just a a person out there who's not a believer, we, we come into a place of receiving grace, divine empowerment. Scripture says when we're born again, we partake of God's nature. So we become different people. That's why we're called, that's why we say we're born again. We become different people. And so the inference here is that Jesus understands temptation. He was tempted and he resisted temptation. And so when we are being tempted with some kind of a sin that we know we don't fall, want to fall into, we can approach God's throne to receive supernatural empowerment so that we can um, find that mercy and that empowerment in a time of need, when we're being tempted with something that we know we need to resist. And so when we're born again, we have that choice. When we're unbelievers, they just have to rely on, you know, being, gritting their teeth, self-will, I'm not going to do that, and... In our culture particularly, most of the time they don't even try because they don't have to. But as believers, we have that choice. In 1 John, he talks about um, now that you're born again, you can not sin. You're able to make that choice not to sin. And, And it also says, but if you do sin, you still have an advocate with Jesus. You still have an advocate with the Father. Jesus is interceding for us. God will not stop loving us if we sin. He will not um, let us down in any way. He will not think less of us. His desire is to get us back on track. But the truth is, as we grow in him, as we follow Jesus, as we desire to become more like him, we sin less. We sin less and less and less. In fact, the things that uh, caused me to sin when I was first born again, so that was quite a long time ago, just to encourage you, (laughs) wouldn't even tempt me now. Things I found really difficult back in my early 20s, 
it wouldn't even bother me now because I've been walking with the Lord a long time. But, you know, there's different things now. There's different things that I have to deal with now. But I've grown in the Lord and that's available to everyone. It's not special for me. But because we are born again people or when we become born again people, there is an empowerment, a divine empowerment to make the choice not to sin if we choose that. And um, I heard a testimony once, it was in the last church that I attended, there was a fellow and he, he got born again and he'd only been walking with Jesus a couple of months and he got, put his hand up to give a testimony in church. We didn't know what he was going to say. And so he got up and, and you know, he was just real happy about it. He said, oh, Jesus has helped me to give up drugs. And Jesus has helped me to stop smoking marijuana. Well, all the leadership were kind of like, we didn't even know he was taking drugs. We didn't even know he was smoking marijuana because in their great wisdom, they would have told him to stop. But I think the Holy Spirit deliberately made sure the leadership didn't know because the Holy Spirit knew when it was the right time to prompt him to give up drugs and to give up smoking marijuana and and then the Holy Spirit empowered him to do it. So he said later on, I was talking to him and his wife and he said, oh yeah, I said to my wife, I should have done this years ago. Could have saved a lot of money. It would have been a lot better. I should have done it years ago. I could have done that ages ago. And she, though, rightly said to him at the time, but you couldn't have done it years ago because you didn't know Jesus years ago. He was able to do it because he'd been born again. You know, it's not just a a term that we rattle out, born again. We really are born again. (laughs) We have a, a spirit that doesn't sin. And if we choose to go and yield to the born again spirit within us, we, we can choose not to sin. Yes, we can still choose to go with our flesh and our carnal nature, but it says in Hebrews that by reason of use, by doing it again and again, we get better, we practice and get better at yielding to our born again spirit. And scripture says our born again spirit won't sin because it's filled with the Spirit of God. So we have a choice if we're born again. In 1 Corinthians 10.13, it says, we will not be tempted beyond what we can bear. Did you know that was in there? You probably think, is that really in there? (laughs) We cannot be tempted beyond what we can bear because God will provide a way out for us to get through it. Now, it doesn't say God will take away the temptation. We live in a world where we will be tempted. We will be tempted to sin. We'll be tempted to miss the mark with God. That's what it means. But it says that he will provide a way out, that we can get through it. Well, what is the way out? It's coming to the throne of grace with confidence so we can receive mercy and a divine empowerment to help us in that time of need. That's the way out. But we have to do that. We have to apply what God has given us. Jason spoke a couple of weeks ago about the weapons of our warfare. They're not natural weapons, they're spiritual weapons, but they're weapons that God has given us because we have an enemy. Jason talked about the armour of God. Well, why do... In the natural, why do soldiers need armour? Because there's an enemy. And so God has given us um, supernatural weapons so that we can resist temptation. Let's have a look at Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. And... Yeah, that, this is a great scripture. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, I'll explain that in a minute, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. 
fixing our eyes on Jesus. So remember, we're, we're talking about following Jesus and becoming more like him. So fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So I might just leave it there. So this scripture, if we take it in context, it comes straight after Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is talking about um, the, the heroes of the faith, really, heroes of the faith from the Old Testament. And so um, the writer of Hebrews goes straight on and says to us, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, so he's giving a, a picture here of us in a race. And he's saying that the people around who are cheering us on are the heroes of the Old Testament, the heroes of faith. And the fact is that they have passed that baton of sharing the gospel and living for Jesus in our generation. They've passed that on to us, just like a relay race. They've passed it on. And he's saying, for you to stay in the race and keep following Jesus, you are going to need to throw off. And in the Greek, it means to sort of cast it away like vigorously. You need to throw off every weight. So a weight can be anything. It can be a grudge. It can be a, a hurt from the past. It can be something that went on that just weighs you down. It can be stuff in your life that's unnecessary, not necessarily bad, but just unnecessary, clutters up your life so that it's difficult for you to do the things you know God wants you to do. He says, throw those off. But he says, and, and get rid of the sin that so easily entangles you. So most of us have got those. Most of us have got stuff that easily entangles us. It might be, you know, addictions. It could be, you know, you just love gossip or it could be anything. But we've all got it. We've all got sin that easily entangles us. But he says, learn to overcome that. Learn to resist that. Learn to throw it off so that you can keep running and following Jesus. So what I'm saying today is not meant to be a negative thing. It's meant to be a positive thing in saying that we are able to do this. And the more we are able to do this, the more effective and fruitful we are in the kingdom of God. And you, if you, like, we've got the Commonwealth Games coming up, and we're going to be watching races, and just about every Olympics or Commonwealth Games, someone is running along, and suddenly, you know, they, they roll their ankle, or their knee goes on them, or something happens, and they, they go down, and, and they have to get sidelined. And spiritually speaking, that's what happens to us if we if we allow sin to overwhelm us, does it mean we lose our salvation? No. Does it mean God doesn't love us anymore? No. Does it mean we can't get back in the race? No. But it means often sin can sideline us for a season. It can affect our, our fruitfulness. It can hold back our effectiveness in the kingdom of God. And we are called to be like Jesus. We're called to be following him in that race, staying in our lane and keeping on, keeping on. And to do that, we need to be able to resist temptation because it, the desire is to take, it out, to take us out of the race. In, um, in 1 Peter 1 and 14 to 16, it, it says, Be holy as I am holy. Now, as a young believer, I used to read that and think, How, how's that supposed to happen? How am I supposed to be as holy as God? Like, you've got to be kidding. But I love it in the Passion Translation. It says, don't shape your life according to the desires you had before you knew any better. Instead, shape your life so that you're becoming more like Jesus. So that's being holy as he is holy. We can do that. God never asks us to do something that we can't do or that he's not willing 
to empower us to do. Always remember that. God will never ask you to overcome a sin in your life until you're ready for that and until he's able to empower you for that. He is so gracious. And so it's not a message. I'm not trying to put out a message that says, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, and don't do that, and if you do, you'll get a fail as a Christian or as a believer. It's not that. It's an encouragement to stay spiritually fit. You know, Rick and I, we watch probably more football than we should. That's one of our temptations. Um, but when, they, when they're playing, they get awful injuries and they go down, you know, and then someone has to come out and help them off the field and they're hobbling along. And, and you can always tell with them, it's not so much the pain of the injury and for me, thinking, it, they don't seem to care they're going to have arthritis for the rest of their lives, these guys. The thing they're most upset about is they're taken out of the game. They're most upset is if they get told it's a season-ending injury. I have seen tough, tough footballers break down in tears if they're told you're out for the rest of the season because of the injury. And in many ways, that should be our attitude with the kingdom of God. I honestly, I, it, I'm at the point now, and I'm fairly old, okay, so it took a while, but I'm at the point now where I just think, I just don't want to be taken out of the game. Nothing is worse getting sidelined from the race as far as I'm concerned. And so I, I just always think, Lord, help me with this. Help me recognise the plans of the enemy. Help me recognise the schemes because I just don't want to get sidelined. I want to serve you with all my heart. And so I just pray that's your prayer too. So Paul does say um, in 2 Corinthians 2, he says, look, we need to be careful that Satan doesn't outwit us and we need to not be unaware of his schemes. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, it means he has schemes. And he has a tailor-made scheme for you. And so we need to be aware of that. We need to put on the armour. You know, Jason talked about it a, a few weeks back. He talked about the armour of God and putting it on piece by piece. And I haven't got time to go through that now. But the reason we have that armour is because we have an enemy who is trying to cause us to stumble, who wants, look, if the enemy can't stop you getting saved, the next best thing is to keep you ineffective. The next best thing is to keep you a lukewarm Christian that just sits on the sideline and criticises everybody that's running by, okay? That's just, that's his favourite thing. And so we need to put on that armour we need, in, in James 4, 7, it says, stand up to the devil, resist him, and he will flee in agony. Like that's the Passion Translation. You might not have read that in normal translations, but I love that. Stand up to the devil, resist him, and he will flee in agony. But we need to be aware that, that we, we are called to do that. We need to put on the armour, otherwise we are vulnerable to the enemy's schemes. You know, at the moment it's fairly cold outside most of the time. Today's quite nice. But, uh, you know, but in my wardrobe I have a lot of warm clothes. And I, I put them on so that when I go outside I'm not cold. And spiritually speaking... We have an enemy who is trying to take us out of the race. But God has given us a wardrobe of armour. Yeah. He's given us weapons. We need to put them on. We need to apply those spiritual weapons to our lives so that we are able to overcome and recognise um, the plans and purposes of the enemy. So I want us to look at some specifics on this now. We're going to look at 1 John 2, 15 and 16. We're going to look at it in two different translations, in the New Living and the Passion. So um, in the New Living it says this, Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. 
So you can use them and like them, but, you know, it's when you put them before God. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Now, this is the recipe. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure. So older translations call that the lust of the flesh. Okay? A craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see. So the older translations call that the lust of the eyes. And pride in our achievements and possessions. So older translations would call that the pride of life. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. So we're going to look at it in the Passion Translation. It says, don't set the affections of your heart on this world or in loving the things of this world. The love of the Father and the love of the world are incompatible. For all that the world can offer us, so here it is, the gratification of our flesh, okay, so that's anything physical, addictions and all that kind of thing, the allurement, the allurement of the things of the world, so just stuff for the sake of stuff because it looks good and I like it, an obsession with status and importance. None of these things come from the Father but from the world. But from the world. Now, this is the recipe. It's the same recipe. The enemy has been using this recipe with every person since Adam and Eve. It's the same recipe over and over. He just changes the icing to suit you. He tailors it for you in some way. We can see it in the Garden of Eden when it says the serpent came to Eve and he said, you know, as God said, you can't touch all the trees. And she said, oh, we can touch the trees but not the one in the centre because God said if we touch it or eat from it, we will die. And the serpent said, you won't die. The enemy will always, always undermine the word of God. He will always tempt you to minimise the word of God, uh, accept that the word of God's not true or somehow or other it doesn't apply to you and your situation he will always attack the word of God in your heart. What's been said to you, what you've read, what's been revealed to you, it is always under attack. And that's why it's so important to know the word of God. But it says then that Eve looked at the fruit. It doesn't say it was an apple. But it says she looked at the fruit. She saw that it was good for food. Lust of the flesh or the craving for physical pleasure. She saw it was good for food. She saw that it looked good. I want that. That looks good. And she saw that it was able to make her wise. Pride of life. In fact, the devil told her that when she had the fruit, she'd be as good as God. She'd be as wise as God. And on the basis of that, it, it will satisfy my physical craving. It looks good and I want it. And I'll be wise. On the basis of that, she took the fruit. And they're the areas that the enemy always comes and tempts us. And Eve should have resisted. She had the choice because she was spiritually alive at this point. And then they died spiritually. She had the choice and she made the wrong choice. And so did Adam. And that's why we needed Jesus to come. And we have the choice. We will be given the same kind of presentation. But we have the choice. Now, a number of years ago, I'm going to tell you a personal story of failure. <laughs> a number of years ago... And I was a lot younger then, okay, I was in my 30s. And um, I was a primary school teacher, and in my opinion, I wasn't making enough money. And, uh, you know, in primary school teaching, you don't get any overtime. You do it, but you don't get paid for it. You can see it still gets, gets up, <laughs> annoys me. Um, you do a lot of overtime, but you don't get paid for it. And I thought, 
you know, I was interested in making more money. So, you know, scripture does say, don't be greedy or you'll be pierced through with many sorrows. And it says, or in one translation, it says, you'll be trapped in spiritual snares. So I was just really a sitting duck for this. But a presentation came to me from a businessman for an investment. He had to invest so much money and it had all the trappings. It had a promise of becoming rich. Yes. I could buy bigger houses and better cars and nice clothes and man, I could do it, you know. So I was very tempted by that at that age. And, and it also looked good. It was presented in a way why, where it was uh, fail-safe, um, didn't seem to be any problems, and I, I wanted to be involved. But it also carried the third thing where it, it kind of made me feel important to be part of a business consortium. You know, like, yeah, I like that. I like going to a business consortium and getting rich. Kind of like that pride of life thing. And so this was presented. And, and I, I was not as, I didn't know as much of the word as I do now. And uh, so I worked out the figures, I had to borrow money to invest. And I worked out the figures, the only way I could do it was to stop giving in the kingdom of God, to stop tithing and to stop giving. You think right there I'd know it wasn't wrong, wasn't right, but I really wanted this. So I went and spoke to a Christian businessman and he said to me, I gave him the scenario, he said, look, God understands. Exactly. <laughs> that was exactly the answer I wanted to hear. God understands. And so I had all this crazy idea that I was going to make lots of money and I'd make it up to God later. It was just this little season that I wouldn't tithe, I wouldn't give, and, uh, and but, you know, it'd be worth it in the long run. And, and even this Christian man, Christian man said, God, I understand. So I sort of jumped in boots and all. That took me, that one temptation that I succumbed to took me out of, out of being effective and fruitful in the kingdom of God for five years. Five years. Because it's the unravelling of the one decision. You know, like with an aircraft, if they take off and they're just a few degrees off course, at first it doesn't matter. But as it goes on, you know, you're miles off course. So I just made this one little decision, one little decision. But... You know, then it was like that parable of the sower, the seed that gets caught in the thorns, the desire for other things, um, and the cares of this world, says, creeps in and chokes the word. Well, obviously, I didn't have a lot of word in there, but what was in there was getting choked. And I became disinterested in the things of God, started going to the beach on Sunday morning instead of coming to church, didn't go to any Christian meetings because, you know, I was busy. Uh, the pride of life, I'm a member of a consortium, for goodness sake, you know. <laughs> what would these Christians know? And, you know, I was still saved. God still loved me. I was still born again. I still called myself a Christian. But I was on the sideline with a season-ending injury out of the game. And you know, would I have gone to heaven? Certainly but no fruit. One temptation bound up in all three, in this case it was a big one, lost money, of course, and I got to a place where, you know, I was down, not depressed, like not on, not clinical depression or anything, but I was down and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, just start reading the Bible. I said, well, I'm a bit busy for that. He said, make time. <laughs> so the only time I had was 5 a.m. in the morning. And I just started doing it mechanically. Like there was no great passion. The alarm didn't go off. And I said, wow, I'm going 
going to get up and spend time with God. I just got up mechanically and started reading the Bible and that turned my life around and got me back on track, literally, so that I was running again behind Jesus slowly and gradually picking up speed. Now, just to finish, I want to have a look at the, the passage where Jesus was tempted so that we can see how he did it, so that we can look at his example. So we're going to look at Matthew 4, 1 to 11, and I'm not going to go on a long time now, just to encourage you. It's getting near the end. So just before I start this, this is the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. But I want to just encourage us that when you get home, if you read the passage before, it's the, temp it's the time where Jesus came to John the Baptist to be baptised. And he was baptised by John in obedience to God. And the Bible says when he came out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove. It wasn't a dove, but like a dove. And Jesus was baptised in the Spirit, I believe, for ministry coming up. And it says, heaven opened and God audibly spoke to him, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Most of us would call that a mountaintop experience, yeah? Immediately he was led into the wilderness to be tempted. So I just want to encourage you in that, that when we're followers of Jesus, there are those mountaintop experiences where you've had a fabulous prophecy and wow, you know, God's, you know, me and God, we're taking the world for Jesus, it's just us, we're so clever. You will then, anything will be attacked by the enemy and you'll go through those times. And, and if it happened to Jesus, don't be surprised if it happens to you and don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged when there's a lot of attack. You haven't done anything wrong. Don't be discouraged if you're in a wilderness time. You, you haven't done anything wrong. If you're there for 40 years, probably check again. But <laughs> for a season, we will all go through wilderness experiences and often it comes after a mountaintop experience. So let's just have a look at how Jesus did this. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit... He didn't stumble in. He didn't get there out of disobedience. To be tempted by the devil. That was the sole purpose. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. One translation says he was famished. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Like prove it. Prove that what God said is true. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He knew the word of God and he knew how to use it against the temptation of the enemy. That's where I went wrong with that investment opportunity. I was not aware of the word of God. I didn't know the word of God said all that it said about money. I just didn't know. Then the devil took him, so that's the lust of the flesh. He was tempted to just feed, his, feed himself because he was hungry. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put, your, put the Lord your God to the test. So he was tempted to make a spectacle so people could see and want what he had because of what they could see. But he knew the word of God. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. The temptation for the pride of life. You can be king of kings and lord of lords without even dying or going on a cross. But Jesus said to him, now notice this, he says, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left him. 
Jesus told him to go and he went. And you have that same authority. You have that same authority over every temptation and, and every attack of the enemy. You have that same authority. If you are born again and you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have that same authority. So understand this. The enemy will undermine and attack the word of God in you. He knows how to use the word deceitfully. And it's so important for us as believers to know the word, to, to, to recognize a temptation and a scheme. And it's so important to resist. It's so important to stay in the race and stay in the game and be fruitful in the kingdom of God. Amen.